The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Before Jason begins, uh, I want to make an announcement to all those people that I'm life coaching that we are going to move to a whole nother level in God. I know it that I know it. And the purpose of the life coaching, I've rather uh, been busy with the life coaching people that have signed up, uh, it's to raise finances for team training center. So just where you know, that's what I'm doing it for primarily, to raise the finance for the team training center because we want to set up a structure uh, for the school in the days ahead. We've got missionaries and other people that are interested in getting our module training. So that's the purpose. So spread the word that for a limited time until my calendar's full, and it's getting full fast, uh, where I'm doing life coaching at a much, much reduced rate compared to when we used to do traveling. Uh, it was quite expensive at that time. So that's it. Jason? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. <clears throat> I was going to read some of the lyrics on these songs, but most of us know a lot of them by heart. Um, th this morning I wanted to talk about hunger and desire. And uh, one of the things that I had spoke of about, uh, was it two, three weeks ago, I, I had talked to everybody about value, and it was a very comforting and uplifting um, message uh, that God wants us to know how valuable we are to him. Um, Today is not going to be as comfortable. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to see a little bit of stuff that we don't really want to look at maybe. But um, don't you want to, the, the thing is, is what, I, what I'm about to, to talk about is going to um, really energize and um, uh, boost the fact that like the, the different things that we, we sing up here even, don't you want those words to actually like penetrate? Don't you want those words to mean something? Instead of, you know, you sing it over and over again. And a lot of times we get that way with scripture. And, it, and it, I mean, I'm just being honest. A lot of scriptures you hear over and over again, the same one over and over again. And then, you know, eventually, you know, sometimes God will, will you know, flick you in the back of the head and give you a revelation on that particular scripture. But until then, it just feels like it's, Da, 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 over and over. Um, I don't want that for any of you guys. I want life to come out of the stuff that, that we have here to, to, to share um, in the mornings and, and uh, with our worship and with the, with the teachings. So um, I felt responsible to, to do that and share this this morning. Um, I'm kind of going along with Paul this morning because I, I had a nice, upbeat, uplifting message on value and then I'm, I'm not I'm not going to be terroristic it's not it's not I'm not evil but Colossians 128 it says so ever <clears throat> so everywhere we go we talk about Christ to all those who will listen warning them and teaching them as well as we know how we want to be able to present each one to God perfect because of what Christ has done for each of them now notice what he's saying here in order to present every Christian believer, perfect in Christ, we must warn as well as teach. So, in that way, as pastors, um, we we we're kind of doing our duty. We're not gonna we're not gonna I'm not gonna sell you a a, a cutesy poo message that tickles your ears and you go home and you feel great and then you know I go to heaven and I you know. They're like, what did, why didn't you warn them? Why didn't you talk to them about this stuff? And I don't want it, but vice versa. Why do they go to heaven and I'm still in sin? And, well, nobody told me I wasn't. Well, so this is, this is where I'm at. I'm not saying that you're all sinners, but we're all born into that, and we're all working our salvation through. So, um, With that being said, I wanted to start out with a little bit in 
Psalms 42. Psalms 42, verses 2 through 4. David is, is he's, he says, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come up here before God? My tears have been my food day and night, and while they continually say to me, Where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. And I thought that was really neat. It shows a lot. Actually, most of the, most of the Psalms, you'll see David going back and forth from his um, remembrance or his mind and his emotions going back and forth. You can see that loop that we, always, that we know is, is there because the, the, they're always they're in bundles, the thought and emotion bundle. But let's read it again in a different translation. I thirst for God, the living God. Where, where can I find him to come and stand before him? Day and night I wept for, for his help. And all the while my enemies taunt me, where is this God of yours? They scoff. Take courage, my soul. Do you remember those times? But how could you forget them? When you led a great procession to the temple in the festival days, singing with joy, praising the Lord. Why then be downcast? Why be discouraged and sad? Hope in God. I shall yet praise him again. Yes, I shall again praise him for his help. And it's, it's really neat because he stirs himself up based on remembering his relationship that he had. Like, like I feel like when we have our desert times and you don't really hear what God is saying, he's still there. And in order to, to really connect, if you're disconnected, in order to really connect, you need that, just recall, bring to remembrance those things of the times that he spoke to you clearly and audibly or whatever, in whatever way. And remember, that the, recall those things and give him praise for those things. And all of a sudden, it's like your, your spirit gets stirred up and you have hope all of a sudden. It's just the way that God works. It's, it's pretty simple. But the way that, that's the way that David lives. That's the way that I want to live um, our, in our daily Christian walk. Because there are going to be times that we don't feel or see or people are saying, you know, what's wrong with you? Where's your God? You know, you're, you've been praying and, and seeking the Lord for this particular thing and you haven't gotten any answers for years. What are you doing? You know, people are just observant like that. But, <laughs> unfortunately, but the thing is, is we remember. And the thing is, in this, in this particular passage, the, the word um, remember is actually zakar, which remain, is remaining in, remaining in memory, remaining in thoughts. It's, it's, it's like continually thinking about those things. Um, What's really interesting at the end where it says, yes, I again shall praise him for his help. This is all about relationship and his, he's, he's reflecting upon the time where he was in the procession and, the, and this, had this wonderful, you knew the presence was there with them because they were probably taking the ark with them. <laughs> Literally, he was there with them. But he was remembering those times that the presence was with them. And that's what, that's what stirred him up to, to be more hopeful and praise the Lord in this time where he was really downtrodden. Um, what's really cool about that is in the support that it says, yes, I shall again praise him for his help. His help literally means for the help of his countenance, his face, his relationship with me. Because he helped him with his countenance. And that's just like when, he's, when you seek your face, when you seek the Lord's face, it's you're seeking that relationship. You're seeking that that. Um, that one-on-one, -on -one, that, that connection, that intimate time over a meal or, you know, when you're prayer time, it's kind of like sitting at the table and, and having him right across from you when you're praying. I, I think Matthew Henry, I think I was reading through his commentary and it said on this particular verse, it says, to, to appear before the Lord is the desire of the upright and it is the dread of the hypocrite Nothing is more grievous to a gracious soul than what is intended to shake its confidence in the Lord. Where is your God? It is what, 
it was not the remembrance of the pleasures of his court that afflicted David, but the remembrance of the free access he formerly had to God's house and his pleasures in attending there. It was, it was what he missed, that relationship. And so while I'm, when I'm, when I, my whole message is basically based on, uh, it's going to be hunger would be the title. The thing is, is I, I want you to try to keep that in your mind as I'm, I'm, as I'm going through this because hunger can be used practically as a spiritual thermometer. If, if, let's say if you're sick, say if you actually, the first thing to go when you have the flu is your appetite. I mean, if you, anybody has ever been sick, they know one of the first, very first things that, that goes is your appetite. And likewise, it's kind of that same way in spiritual. If you have no hunger and no appetite for the things of the Lord, you're sick. There's something wrong. And so many of us come and go, and we have our, our church services, and we, we have, some of us have daily devotions and everything, but for a lot of us, the, the mundane, day-to-day, ritualistic stuff, even Sunday can become such, as, you know, you're going to church, you go to church, and then you go home, and you, you have your dinner, and you do whatever. Um, when, there's, when there's a lack of something, we know that there, we have a need. When we don't lack of anything, we just kind of don't depend on God. If we're, you know, we're stable, and we're steady, and we're okay with the status quo, then we never really want to dig in and, and, and pull on stuff because we're already satisfied. And I don't want that for anybody here. I, don't, I, I want people, and a lot of us here have actually caught this, is the fact that we don't have to live this way. And at the end of this teaching, um, we're going to really pray through some of this stuff. And... Um, Things that you might not even know are actually hindering you from that relationship and from that um, hunger, so to speak, uh, for the things of God. Some of us can't wait to get up in the morning just to read a scripture. Some of us can't wait to get up in the morning to look at Facebook. And I'm not saying I'm not, I'm not saying that to condemn, but I know it's true. I mean, just being just being honest. So what's wrong? You might defend yourself, you know. No, I don't want you to defend. This is a place that we can be open and, and, and honest with each other and, and work through it. I'm here not to, to condemn. I'm here because I want to see you guys set free and live a life that's better than what you are currently experiencing, even though you feel maybe it's okay the way it is. Okay? Practicing his presence is, is a discipline that we all need to have. We really do. Otherwise, we're never going to get in. We're never going to get in there. And if we never really know what we're missing, then we're never really going to strive after something that we never knew. So we really got to do that. Backsliding, actually. Nobody likes to really talk about that. But it doesn't start with a person finding themselves in bed with a strange woman. It doesn't start that way, does it? You don't wake up one morning and say, I'm just going to sin. It doesn't happen that way. It's subtle. It's over time, whatever. It doesn't begin with the act itself. It begins when we find ourselves indifferent to the scriptures and the things of God. When we begin to find ourselves indifferent towards the things of God. We can go to church. We don't have to go to church. We can listen to the pastor. We don't have to listen to the pastor. It's, it's all good. You know, it's a Sunday. We've got time off. Whatever. It's a family day. It's, it's kind of scary, though, because you can become indifferent really easily, especially over things that are repeated over and over again. The funny thing is, is a lot of us, especially those in like, well, a lot of us that have been churched, then we believe, you know, we've been praying, Lord, increase my hunger for you. Lord, you know, increase my hunger for you. 
And ultimately, that hunger is our responsibility. It's not his. Now, we can, we can ask, but we have to realize what we're actually asking for. And that's what I'm going to get into. When we ask, Lord, increase our hunger, there's, there's a whole slew of stuff that goes behind that. Because one of the things that, one of the things that will increase your hunger is actually dealing with all the stuff that is in place of all the junk food that you're feeding your spirit to, you know. It's kind of like you get hungry for what you feed on. And over the years, um, it's like I, I determined to eat healthy. So I started eating salads and things like that. I hated vegetables my whole life. But eventually, I become to like them after eating them over and over again. It's like I, I developed a taste for them. And it's kind of the same way in the spirit realm. Um, you'll, the more that you read and pray and study, and the more that you do those things, it's like you can't work this up. However, if you are just starting out and you want to turn back and say, yeah, I am, I am, I'm on Facebook way too much, or I'm, I'm just you know, doing this way too much or whatever, and you want to start, stop doing whatever you, you know is taking up your time and do something that you know that God wants you to do. And eventually, it'll start getting into where I can talk to you about the rest of this. <laughs> You'll become more hungry for it. When, when God starts revealing one scripture at a time, here and there, after you made that decision consciously to read a little bit more in the morning, pray a little bit more in the afternoons, you know, instead of, or catching yourself just with the hustle and bustle of daily life, you can actually just kind of blow off a lot of different things of God. Don't. Just choose not to and, and, and see where it goes. It might just be one little decision. Oh, yeah, I'm, I've been on this computer way too long. Go to, your, go to your Bible, read a couple of scriptures. When God shows you, starts showing you or rewarding you for your obedience, you'll get that little glimpse of what that scripture is that you read over and over again, and it was nothing to you. One day it will be. And then you will be hungry for more. Your spirit will start wanting more and more. Now, it sounds like I'm, I'm telling you to do a lot of things just by action, and getting it done and getting it done, but it's, it's not true. This is about relationship. You have to make a choice, though, because the, when, when God says, it, you know, he will draw people to him, and it's like his thing, that's basically when he was talking about the unsaved. The saved, however, we have a choice. We can, we can approach him, or we, didn't, we don't have to approach him. You know, we can, we can come to him in prayer, we can read our Bibles and stuff, but we don't have to. And sometimes he comes to us graciously, we, and I give him thanks and glory for that. And sometimes we have to go to him. It's just like any father, father and son relationship, father and daughter relationship. Sometimes they're approachable, sometimes they're not. It happens. So again, we're still responsible for that hunger of our own for him. Proverbs 27, 7, I was reading it, sounds it was really interesting to me, um, and it kind of fits into this message pretty well. It simply states, a satisfied soul loathes the honeycomb. And when I was thinking about that, the satisfied soul loathes the honeycomb. In other words, if our souls are filled with the cares of this world or our own means, and we never give glory to God for any of it, We can lose our hunger for God because we feel we don't need God. Whether or not we're actually telling us, you know, telling us ourselves that or not. We become less dependent. We don't cry out for him. We don't cry out for his wisdom and his mercy and his love. We don't cry out. Why? It's kind of like when your Thanksgiving just passed not too many months ago, and you fill up at one one relative's house and you eat all this turkey and all this stuffing, and of course 
my wife's stuffing is just so incredible. I can't, I can't get enough of it. And then I am packed to the gills with stuffing. But anyway, and it's good. The thing is, is once that happens, do you, do you, you have to wait for, for like till the evening before you want dessert. You can't even fit it. And a lot of people just pass out, you know? I do. The thing is, is once you fill up on that, you see where I'm getting at, is you fill up on the stuff that ne might necessarily be good for you, but you lose your appetite after, whether it's good or not. You filled it with something. When I was in, at, at, in contrast to that, when I was in Bible school, we went on these really prolonged fasts. Um, some of us went 40 days with just water, and um, and it was incredible. Some of the some of the stuff that had happened was just incredible. But um, the smaller fasts were, were 10 days, and most of the guys did it. I was um, the president of the class at that time, and so I was kind of ahead to see ahead of the guys to see how well they were doing and everything, and making sure that they were still healthy and stuff because. After a prolonged fast, your, your stomach and everything gets whacked, and you don't you get a little kooky sometimes um, for food. But after the first, you know, the first few days, you you want to eat everything in sight. You are a hungry person. <laughs> after that, it kind of wanes a little bit. But but in contrast, though, if I would if they would have put like a turkey leg in front of me. While I, you know, while I was fasting, it would be a whole lot different of being putting a turkey leg in front of me after I just had a, a gourmet, you know, Thanksgiving meal. And and there's varying levels of that, of whether you would want to, you know, chow down on that thing or not, or just kind of pick at it, you know, to be polite to whoever gave it to you. But and it's but the thing is, it's the same in the church. We we have varying levels of of needs that we have that we met ourselves and needs that we have met um, by God and they're at various levels so we all come in at different levels we're all different here um, so this is what kind of happened with the church the indifferent church the church of Laodicea to the, to the degree that you are filled with the desires of this life determines the response to his call on yours. Right? To the degree that you're filling your life with stuff because you feel like you have a need for a person, place, or a thing. Mother, father, child, wife, vacation. It determines your response to his call in your life. Let's look at this church that Jesus talked about in Revelations 3. Too often people in church are a little indifferent in their desire for the things of God. Most don't despise his presence, but they're, they're maybe casual towards the feast that's set before them. I thought this was interesting that... The, the letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelations, I feel like they're not just history. They're actually, they're prophetic. They're for us now. Um, and one of the last churches, which could be even the way that this, the state of the church is right now or going to be when, when Christ comes, is the church of Laodicea. It was the, the indifferent church, the lukewarm church. Maybe because, you know, it might be because of his... In the last days, it's the way that the church is going to be. Maybe it is now. I think that the, I think that I could even fall in some of that. I was really convicted when I was learning this stuff, and and really had to pray through some things. We're going to be doing that later, which is really good. But right after the church, the, the letter to the church was written. It it, it was basically. Um, I think the trumpet sounded, and it sounded like a, a call from heaven. God um, said, come up here, and that was Revelations 4. So I'm thinking it might be the end of the church thing. But anyway, that was just what I was batting around in my head. Jesus declared this church to be in a lukewarm state. 
Putting it in more modern terms, they lacked passion and casually treated what was important to him. They rarely went out of their way to please him. But what caused this behavior? Now, this wasn't just a church that nobody knew about. This wasn't a self-proclaimed church. This wasn't somebody, you know, a group of five people that just said, I, hey, I'm, I'm doing this. And that they, this is actually something that they, that scripture, that, that's in the scripture that is given to us for a purpose. I mean, Jesus even, quote, you know, talked about this church. So I know that it's important for us to learn. The reason that they are like this, he said, was because they said that they were rich and they've become wealthy and they have no need of nothing in Revelations 3.17. These words show their lack of passion because their souls are already satisfied, sadly, not in him, but in things. Now, none of us are like extremely wealthy here. I mean, I don't know, maybe we are. But we all are generally middle, middle class citizens as far as income. We don't have any gold bricks sitting at home that, you know, we prop up our TVs on or anything silly like that. But regardless, David did, you know. He had hundreds of billions of dollars worth of gold and silver and, and iron and and yet he still looked at himself as poor and needy in a lot of scriptures. There's a, it's a, it's a, when, when he was in a deficit, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a, a material deficit. He never let those things get in the, and, and plug in the holes in our lives that, that, that we need filled by, or we feel that we need filled by something. We'll fill it with something if we all have needs. But he never let the, his material wealth or, anything, or his, his, anything go to his head as far as that goes. He constantly realized the, the, the state of his soul his, and the state of his spirit. And when he was hungry and missing a connection with the Lord, he knew it. Let's look how David describes himself, like I said before. He said, bow down your ear, O Lord. Hear me, for I am poor and needy. He says, bow down your ear. He's like way below the Lord at this point. He's like, doesn't, he doesn't say that, bow down your ear to me because I am the king and rich ruler of this particular country or continent or castle. He said, I am poor and needy. Bow down your ear to me. Please hear me. He calls himself poor and needy even when the stockpiles of gold and silver are all around him. His need was for God himself. And it was, it was cultivated by divine hunger. He had a divine hunger. He had the hunger for the spiritual realm. He had a hunger for, for that relationship with, with his Savior. He's desperate for God's answer, desperate for his reply. He is hungry and thirsty for intimacy. This is why so much passion, there's so much passion in some of the verses in, in, in the Psalms where he's showing and bearing his soul and his emotions. He's, he's passionate, about, passionate about wanting that intimacy with God back or giving praise to him for the intimacy. When you look at The, the uh, verse that I had started out with, it says, My tears have been my food day and night while they continue to say to me, Where is your God? That's just, he, you knew that he felt it. It wasn't just, it wasn't just a time of, of dryness in his life and that he could just go and buy a new TV set. Or, you know, it, he chose God. He could do and buy and build and create anything he wanted to. He had everything at his fingertips. He had multitudes of servants, but he chose God when he felt need. The church of Laodicea's issue wasn't material things, like I said, but rather they allowed the material things to satisfy their souls. David never let this happen. I don't want this to happen for you guys. I don't want anything, you know, it could be an agenda, it could be something good even, it could be a, a ministry, 
that you really want to do. But if you really want to do it, you better check yourself that it's God. Well, you say, well, how could it not be God? It's a godly thing. Well, that's, that doesn't matter. It's did you let it fill that part of the, your spirit that God wanted to fill? Maybe with it, maybe with something else. The remedy for the indifferent church. What is the remedy for the indifferent church? In Revelation 3.20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And everybody's heard the scripture over and over again, especially in this, in this church. He doesn't stand at the door of your head and knock. He stands at the door of your heart. <laughs> and we use that scripture a lot. It was, Jesus was actually speaking in Revelation 3.20 to the indifferent church. They were a church. They knew better. What they were missing was a lack of intimacy they, did, they were already satisfied with everything that they, that, they, that they had, that they grew, they ate whatever they, they, you know, they had everything they needed. And so they lost the lack, I mean, they had a lack of um, need for his presence. They were, satis they were fed and satisfied for what, with what they possessed. And this hindered their passion for the presence and his fellowship. When Jesus was speaking to the church on that scripture 320, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, opens the door, I will come in and, and I will eat with him and him with me. Jesus was speaking to this church, to believers who lacked passion for the things of God. He was saying, if anyone hears, let, what keeps us from hearing? It's stuff that's in the way. It's It's simple. Or hearing correctly even, we hear it through filters. It's a soul that's already satisfied by something that other, other than God. Idol, I guess you can call it an agenda. Um, ministry, like I said. Could be something noble, but not God. The New Living Translation, it says, I will come in and share a meal as friends. And back then, even, even now, it's, it's not too, too much different. But back then, it was really, um, it showed a, a sign of social intimacy when you have a meal with someone. And a lot of times nowadays, even um, when you're when you're at a meal and you're one on one with um, someone, are, you basically you, you open your hearts a lot of times over food. And I love food, but and and that's what happens. It's like it, it just happens. It's the way God has it. And if, and that's why they knew back then when he was explaining this, I would I would come into you know come and be with you. He, he's he's saying that if you would just hear, if you would hear me and let me in. I would, I would spend time with you. I would, I would give you that intimacy that you need, that I know you need, but you don't. And when he was, that's why he spoke to that church that way. It's, it's interesting though. I mean, even as a, as a side note, when, when Paul later in, in the, I think it's in First Corinthians, he, he tells us not to sup with people that are in blatant rebellion, or in, in a habitual sin. Um, it's because of that intimacy that you have over a dinner or a meal. It's, it's, they don't, the exchange, the spiritual exchange there won't be really that good. And he's warning, he warns that in 1 Corinthians. Um, not that, you know, you look back at Jesus and you, and you think, oh my gosh, well, he sat with tax collectors and, and prostitutes and, and all this and that. Um, yeah, but there's a difference. It, there's, that's not contradictory. There's a difference. Christ always was there to inspire change and to give an, a way out and hope. There was never a time where he sat next to somebody to beat him with the cross, right? We don't, we don't do that. We don't beat people with, you know, with Bibles. You got to do this. You got to do this. You got to be this way. We have to show them. We got to point them to the cross, but we don't got to beat them with it. Our responsibility is not to push people from sinning into, we're, we're supposed to give them the answers. And that's what Christ did when he would sit down next. I mean, you look at all the scriptures that he was in. It was always to, it was always to, um, to set them free. It was never to condemn. Um, and the thing, and, and the other thing is it wasn't to ignore. It wasn't to say, okay, you're fine. You're a prostitute. That's okay. You know, it doesn't work that way either. 
So, I mean, the, the, the hyper grace and then the, the hyper law, I guess you could call it, neither of those work. And they, they end up ruining both, you know, both parties. We have to point them to the direction, continually say there's a way, there's a way out. God gave, God died for you. He sent his son to die for you so that you can have the grace to live a better life than what you're living right now. Whether or not you believe that you can or that you were born that way or whatever, you have a way to live a better life. Don't you want to look into it? There's a way, always. And that's all we're responsible for. And that's what Jesus did when he was with the tax collectors and the prostitutes and, and all of that. Anyway, that was my side note. What we want to do when we finally figure out that we got maybe some stuff in the way, maybe we don't want to admit it that we got some things in the way that we don't want to, there's some things that we want to hold on to um, that we've had for our whole life. Say, I want to do this, I'm going to get, I'm going to get married, and this lady's going to look like this, and I'm going to live on the coast, and I'm going to, you know, there's some things like that that maybe we haven't, we haven't looked at for a long time. Um, we might want to do that just to check to make sure that God's in it. And the, because the thing is, is it's dangerous. When you, when you want to go and, 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 you, and you have any of that stuff in your heart, God possibly will answer according to what you have in your heart. And that's, that's in Ezekiel. Um, he answers according to the idol that's in their heart. He gave them what they wanted, but he was not a happy God. So when you find out that there's certain things, and I'm telling you that there are certain things because we're, we're all here in, in, in this world, there's things that, that the Holy Spirit wants to bring up in us that, that he would like to take care of, even though we, we maybe think we're perfect or something. <laughs> or <laughs> I'm so not perfect. The thing is, we don't want any of that stuff in the way because I don't want to be answered. I don't want to have something in my heart that I've been really longing for and get it. Because God said, okay, well, I'll give it to you. You wanted it. I don't, I don't want that kind of... I want God. I don't want stuff. Right? It's hard sometimes to let that stuff die. But the, the ultimate, in the ultimate end, that God will fill that gap and that void the way that he wants it filled, and you won't even notice it, it's it's it, he'll he'll have what exactly you need, not not what you think you do, or not what you always desired and wanted. It might not be anything what you desired and wanted, and you might just get something really crazy, blow your mind, but it'd be perfect for you, and that changes your life. So, what do we do when we come to the Lord? We need to really have a neutral heart. Like I said, we don't want anything in the way. We want, we, want, we want God to, you know, either come to us with instruction or correction and be okay with that, right? We don't, we don't want to be answered according to the idols in our hearts. You know, he doesn't say anything about physical idols. I mean, it's not like telling us that we, have to, we had one in our, our, our living room or we put one in our front yard or in our garden. No, he's not talking about idols like that and we worship a different name and all that stuff. He's talking literally about idols in your heart. And I mean, just ask the Holy Spirit, what is there? What could be considered an idol, which is actually something that is lowering God's image to a point where we can get whatever we want from this particular image. We don't want to do that. The root of all idolatry, which I thought was really interesting, I was just looking at the one scripture, is coveted, covetousness. I don't want to strive for anything that is of the flesh. I don't want to strive for anything that isn't of God. I don't I don't want to look back in my in my life and see anything that I really 
wasted time, you know, on stuff that I find out now that it didn't matter then, you know. I want to I want to get in a relationship with the Lord that I want to wake up every morning and say, "Good morning, Lord." What are we going to do today? You know. And that's completely possible. It's completely possible to have that that presence 24/7, just like the book. And not let the things of this this stuff get in the way. <clears throat> I, when I figured out that it was in, that um, the idolatry was tied to the covet, covet, covetousness, <laughs> it's basically because we are needing, we have a need that needs filled. And we're born with need. We were born with a need that's the shape of God, but we shove the square peg in the round hole all the time. Um, but covetousness keeps that hunger there for the wrong peg. <laughs> and so if there's, you know, there's anything that I could teach you guys is the fact that if you are coveting anything, like, oh, the bigger house, or oh, the, you know, this or that, or the, the, the set of golf clubs, or, you know, it's, it's silly, sounds silly, but if it's stuffed in some place in you that it shouldn't be, and it has that much power over you, and it distracts you that much, then it's, it's wrong. And it could lead you into deception. This is why we're told in Hebrews 13:5 to let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things that you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The remedy for all of this is by bringing those things to the cross. And we have the tools here in the church to that you know we've learned over the, the weeks on um, how to deal with these things and how to bring it to the cross and literally bringing things to the cross is what they do here. Um, so we shouldn't, this shouldn't be anything really new sounding, but I really wanted, it was, for me, it was a very, it was an eye-opener as far as indifference. And we don't even think it's not, because we see so much attack and so much power behind certain different things, but indifference doesn't have much anything. Indifference is, eh. And we don't, so the thing is, is it kind of slides through. And, and I don't want that. I want to, to have everybody wake up. I want everybody to, to be able to read the scripture and have life in it. I want everybody to be able to sing on Sunday mornings and, and have it come out of their spirit that they're relating to, I don't want to be anywhere but in your presence. Lord. You know, those lyrics are like, they were written by someone that you could tell is in their presence, that, that needs that presence, that they don't need the, the money and the fame and, and all that. They need his presence, right? And that's the way I want to be. I don't, I don't need, want to need anything but his presence. I don't want to need anything but him because I fully rely on him for everything. And it's not because I don't have anything. I have everything I need. But it's according to Him. Right? And I want that for you guys. And I know that this was hard because I, I read a lot and I put a lot of notes in. Um, but it doesn't make it any less important. I want to see, I want to see results. I want to see more hunger. I don't want to go ahead and just pray, God, more hunger for me. Well, you're, you're, you're letting him take what's in the way of causing you hunger. And that's the key. So, um, just, just a little bit. I mean, even on the last message I had, I had spoke to you about the value and how he sees us and he wants us and, and how he wants us delivered and he wants us set free. And I, and I just 
want to bring those things to remembrance because he, he values us so much that he wants us to be able to have that relationship with him. And he'll stand there and wait. And he'll be always reaching out. But sometimes we got to make that effort. And we got to, you know, go to, the, go to the cross and dump our stuff. In Exodus uh, 19.4, it says, You have seen what the Egyptians, what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Isn't he awesome? In Exodus 34.14, he says, For he is a God who is passionate about his relationship with you. He's passionate about us. And that relationship. And of course, the Psalms 139, 17 through 19. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They are innumerable. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. Let's return the favor of how God is so good for us and so willing to have that relationship. And, and he gave his son so that we wouldn't have anything between us, so that we could live our salvation with him. In, in, that, in that relationship, in that divine relationship. Let's return the favor. Let's begin rooting out some of this junk that we had filled, that his rightful place was. And let's see how our hunger changes and develops over time. Amen. Okay. Well, uh, while Jason was giving a message, my Bible just kind of really just flipped open and everything he said is outlined in a short period, and we want to pray it. Listen to this. In Psalm 105, he said, I brought them out with silver and gold. He's talking about the children of Israel, brought them out of Egypt. He said, there was not a feeble one among them, a cloud of fire to give light by night. The people asked for quail, and I satisfied with them the bread of heaven. I opened up the rock and gushed out water. But Jason was covering stuff about remembering and how important it is. They soon forgot his works. Hard to imagine we could forget the good things that God has done in our life and how he delivered us out of whatever it was we were in. I was into plenty. But it says they forgot his works. There's where there's the need to remember. Secondly, they didn't wait for counsel, but they coveted. They lusted exceedingly. And you know what? They tempted God in, in the desert. And in their covetousness, he gave them their request. Now listen to this. But he sent leanness into their soul. I'll give you the quail. I'll give you all those things you think you just have to have. I'll give you, in response to the covetousness of your heart, I'll give you enough quail. That, remember, it was coming out of their nose. I think that's more than enough. All right. And he said, I gave, you, I gave them their request, but I sent leanness into their soul. This is exactly what Jason is bringing. I believe it's a very timely message. That if you're filled with that other stuff, your spirit's going to be lean. Or the leanness of your soul means there's going to be very little God. Because there's no room for him. It's either going to be filled with him and the desires here and the appetites for him. I think one of the best things God ever did to me was he showed me that he was... what I wanted, whether it was good times or bad times, whether there was the finances and all the needs on whether you were poor, made no difference. He was the same. You learn to abound, you learn to be abased. If the focus is on that I need him. So I think we need to pray this morning here uh, to really, Matter of fact, I think it would be good to even humble ourselves because he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. You could have all kinds of finances. You could be established quite well. Uh, say that I have need of nothing. But blessed are the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit are basically those who recognize that they need him. And they are not saying I am rich and without need. Let's, let's ask for God to stir up a deeper hunger in us. And who knows what God would do to a corporate assembly that truly said, uh, how many saw things in your life that you think are just utterly important while Jason was talking? That uh, in and of themselves are not bad. Hmm? If not, you need a revelation of that because that means that you're unaware. Let's ask for an awareness of that right now, okay? Let's ask the Holy Spirit, search my heart. Search my heart for the things that 
that I do. And I'll tell you, one of the ways you can tell what it is, even if it seems harmless, it's the first thing you do in the morning before God. If there's something that's first, something that distracts you, something that takes, and first things are no longer first, that thing, so why not surrender that to God and say, God, you know what, I'm going to say good morning to you before I go to that thing, whatever that thing is. So Father, right now, we just pray for a spirit of wisdom and insight in the knowledge of you, and that uh, uh, whether we are, regardless of our outward conditions, whether we abound and overflow in blessings, or whether we've been abased and going through a hard place, nonetheless, you will supply all of our need according to your riches and glory. And those needs are spiritual before they're natural. So I'm saying you are the bread, not that's on my table, but you're the bread of life. So Father, right now, we just pray that you would open up your heart, that we open up our heart, and that uh, you're standing, uh, and it's not presumptuous to believe that he's standing at the door of our heart right now. And he wants to come in, and he wants a deeper relationship with us. He wants intimacy with us. And we're going to ask right now by the power of the Holy Spirit, if I am full or I am filled with other things, then right now, God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I want to release them back to you. They may not be bad in and of themselves, but if they're taking your place, I release them back to you, and I empty myself of every person, place, or thing that is ruling and has dominion over a sincere, open appetite for the things of God. I yield, I yield those things and release those things that they might be replaced by a hunger for you. Nothing's that important that it has to stand in the way. What did he say about the church you say you're full and rich. I say you're naked and needy. What did he tell them to do? He said, repent. Let's repent of even blind spots. Wouldn't you like that one? Because you know what happens if you repent of a blind spot? God will reveal it. <laughs> one thing about God is it might be a blind spot, but if you repent of it, he will reveal himself. So Father, right now, any blind spots in our lives, I am humbling myself before you and asking by the power of the Holy Spirit, reveal any blind spots in our life. I ask you to reveal it, and then we will release it. Repentance means I am determined as an act of my will to change. Once I see it, once I welcome your presence to turn it around, I will act on it accordingly in the days ahead. Anything else? Okay. Let's stand as an as a indication that God who began a good work will continue it. And again, to those people that I'm life coaching, we're moving to another level in Jesus in the days ahead. And so, Father, we just thank you that for the, in that place of intimacy, in that place of passion, there's people emerging in the body of Christ that are going to be leaders, tomorrow's leaders, but today they're in preparation and they are increasing their appetite for God himself, laying aside even legitimate things to pursue him more fully and more completely. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.